If you're looking for a great way to waste a bunch of money when you're building a subwoofer box, this, uh, <laughs> this is how you do it. You totally destroy your plywood while you're cutting it. In this video, I'm going to show you what went wrong, show you how to fix it. And then when we're done, we're going to test out this awesome Dayton Audio Ultimax 2 subwoofer. As you can see right here in this shot, I am using a CNC machine instead of a table saw to make the cuts. And I want you to watch what happens. First, notice this fuzz on the edge of the cut. That fuzz is no big deal. It's going to sand right off. But take a closer look. On this pass right here, the dust collector didn't collect the dust. That's more than just annoying. That's a sign there's a big problem. If you look right here, you can see the dust boot is clogged. This plywood has an outer veneer, and if you cut across the grain on that outer veneer, you create this fuzz, and that fuzz is just short strands of wood fiber. But if you cut along the grain of that outer veneer, instead of getting fuzz, you get strings of wood fiber and long splinters. Those long hairs and those splinters are clogging up the dust boot. You can see that material right here in the dust boot. There's no safe way to fix this while the machine's running, and if you don't do something about it, eventually the machine is going to crash and you're going to be left with a bunch of useless scrap wood and a bunch of wasted time. So what's the solution? Well, step one is to turn off the camera and do some dust collection maintenance. So I dumped out the cyclone and I cleaned out the filter and that gave me improved suction. So I grabbed the rest of my plywood, threw it up on the machine and it's still clogged. After doing a little bit of research, what I learned is the type of bit that I was using on the machine was causing the fuzz. So I switched out an upcut bit for a downcut bit. A downcut bit will leave a smoother cut on the top of the workpiece. But the problem is that's going to throw your sawdust in your wood chips down. That makes it harder for the dust collection to suck up those wood chips and it's going to leave a lot of trash down in your cut path. Your end mill will have to cut through that trash on the next pass. But it fixed the clogged dust boot problem and now there's no fuzz that's going to save you time later. You don't have to sand that stuff off. But it does make some other problems. More on that in a bit. With all the pieces cut out, it's time to do a dry fit. And you can see right here one of the reasons why a CNC machine may be worth all the expense and hassle. It makes the assembly a whole lot easier. The pieces just kind of slide into these dados. It's also going to give you more glue surface area so you'll have a stronger glue joint. If done right, all the pieces snap together like a jigsaw puzzle. You can see here that I'm using a window brace for this build. In a previous video, I commented about the downsides of this style of brace, and a lot of people walked away with the impression that you should not use internal bracing. That's not what I said in that video. What I said was this brace took a lot of work, and there are faster, easier ways to brace your enclosure. To do this, you've got to mark out four holes, rough cut all the pieces, and then flush trim them with the router. That involves taking a lot of time standing at the router table, cutting out template tape, and sticking templates to the workpiece so that you can flush trim it with the router. If you like spending your entire day standing at a router table, making square shaped holes, knock yourself out. With a CNC machine, the time consuming part is setting up the machine. Once that's done, cutting out these four windows takes an extra five minutes. One thing you want to make sure that you plan for when you're cutting these rectangular shaped dados into your workpiece, the corners are going to be slightly rounded. That actually works great for what we're doing here since you need to put a round over on the inside corner of your port and on the end of your port. For assembly, I always recommend starting with the port itself. Put it together before you do anything else. Then when you start putting the actual box together, you want to work on the walls and then put the port inside the enclosure as one big piece. In this case here, where you have dados for the port and the brace, you can just slip them into position right at the start. If it's all set up correctly, you'll get a good tight fit. You might not even need to drive in any brad nails.
So here I've got everything flipped over. I'm driving nails into what will be the bottom of the enclosure. Here's one thing I wanted to point out, the downside of that down cut bit. It left some rough edges and caused some splintering. What you want to do here is just fill in those gaps with wood glue and sawdust and then sand it flat. During the assembly process, all of the extra effort to cut those rabbits really pays off. Typically, you need to grab a bunch of clamps to use as extra hands, but all of the parts line up perfectly thanks to the CNC grooves. This probably cuts the assembly time in half. While I'm doing that, I need to say thank you to all of my patrons and channel members with a bonus shout out to $25 and up patrons, Jonathan Joaquin, JD America, Timothy, and Bo. To avoid nail holes on the outer baffle, you can just clamp it in place and walk away while the glue dries. Since I had a ton of scrap plywood laying around from the whole sheet that I ruined, I glued several different grits of sandpaper to some of that scrap to make some sanding blocks. You want to invest a little bit of time sanding the inside of that port to make sure you've got smooth airflow. Typically, you want to round over your port to help with port noise, but with this particular design, the port's about an inch wider than it really needs to be, so you can skip the round over in this case. Speaking of the design, if you would like the plans for this enclosure, you can hit the links down in the video description and check them out. This next step is optional. I think the box looks better if you'll go ahead and take a few minutes to paint the port and the speaker cut out. And of course, you wanna make sure that you mask off all the plywood so you don't get paint on it. Now there are some nail holes in the top, bottom, and back of this enclosure. You can fill those in with some wood putty and then sand everything down. For the exterior, we're going with some blue unicorn spit that's been diluted and mixed in with some Minwax water-based poly. If you want to see more wood grain, dilute it a little bit more. If you want more of the color, dilute it a little bit less. Diluting it with water works really well for getting it to soak into the plywood. It'll dry to a chalky finish. After it's dry, you want to hit it with some clear poly so it shines. These here are my my new favorite speaker terminals. You can check them out in the link down below. After some experimenting, I've learned the best way to install them is to drill a 7 16th of an inch hole. That way they'll thread tightly into the wood itself. Here's the subwoofer. This is a Dayton Audio Ultimax, the updated version two. Again, there will be a link down in the video description. This is a dual two ohm subwoofer. So after consulting the resistance calculator on DIYAudioGuy.com, I know I can wire the coils in parallel to get a one ohm nominal impedance.
It's always best practice to pre-drill your screw holes before you mount the driver. This little black box right here is called a DATS. It plugs into the USB port on your computer. You can do a lot one of those things. You can verify the tuning frequency of your enclosure. We get right around 34 hertz, which is exactly what I was shooting for. In addition to a sweep with the DATS, I also did a sweep in Room EQ Wizard using my calibrated microphone. First thing I want to point out is this dip right here at about 60 hertz. That's probably from a wave bouncing off the floor of the garage back up towards the microphone. Between that point and about 27 hertz, we get a slight roll off followed by a steeper roll off between 27 and 20 hertz. So of course, the million dollar question, how does it sound? Let's play a few tracks in, get Give it a listen. My completely subjective assessment of the sound quality, I think I like the original Ultimax better. But I'm running completely on memory, I've not listened to an original Ultimax in several years. And I've not taken the time to properly break in this subwoofer. So is this better than the original? At this point, it's still a coin toss. One thing that I like to do is play some really low frequency stuff at around 20 hertz and below to see if the subwoofer makes a lot of mechanical noise. This one did not. This is a very low distortion driver. It's got a really clean sound. Sound. That's exactly what you need if you're building a home theater subwoofer like this one right up here. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel, and I will see you on the next adventure.